Hello and welcome to the Widow's Oil. Today I want to speak about the word Rehoboth, which you can see um, on my wall. It's often on my wall on my videos and that uh, word has a specific meaning to me, which I would like to um, share with you today. The word Rehoboth um, that I want to discuss today refers to a well that Isaac dug when he was in the land of Gerar. Now I will um, read that uh, part for you and we will discuss it, but I do want to show you that there is another Rehoboth also in the Bible and that um, knowing these things we can learn something quite uh, interesting about it that I'd like to share with you today. So if we look at the E sword, um, we can see that uh, this Rehoboth uh, appears in four verses. The one verse is the one that I'm speaking of that has to do with a well that Isaac dug. And then the other Rehoboth is a city. Um, so there are two Rehoboths. And to me, it has like a positive and a negative um, connotation. So there is the city Rehoboth, and then there is a well that gives water Rehoboth. And if you look at the meaning of the word Rehoboth, then it's quite interesting. So if you look at this root word, H7339, you see that it means width or a uh, avenue or an area or a broad place or a way or a broad place, a broad way or a street. So that immediately brings to mind where Jesus warns us not to walk on the broad way, but to follow the narrow way. Now let's quickly be thorough and also look at this uh, root word, which this one comes from H7337. Now, that word, which is the very basic root, it seems, of all these words, means to broaden or to make room or to make or open wide. And you will see later, as I um, compare different scriptures with each other, that this is quite significant. So if you look at the um, story of Isaac and his wells, um, it's, it says there, just to quickly look at it, it's, he called this third well Rehoboth because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. So you can see that word Rehoboth has to do with having room or a broad place or a broad way. Now, as I said, the Lord warned us uh, in Matthew 7, verse 13 to 14, we read, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. So there is a broad way that is not a good broad way, but this well, um, I'm going to show you, has a positive meaning, a positive meaning of um, having room. Now, if you look in Genesis 10, you see the city Rehoboth, and I will show you that this is a negative uh, connotation for us because it's got to do with the kings of Edom because this city um, is connected to Nimrod. I will show you here. Yeah? Um, the, these, it starts there with the generations of the sons of Noah, and then it speaks here of Nimrod, which you will probably know um, very well. So it says, and Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter, hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Ereth. And so it goes on in the land of Shinar. And then it says, out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Kalah. 
So that's the first time we read of Rehoboth, and it is a city um, from the land of Shinar, which we know is connected to Babylon and to Nimrod. So that obviously connects to a broad way, which Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. It's connected to Babylon, which is that harlot city. The second time you see this Rehoboth, um, it's also, it's a city and it's in uh, one uh, Chronicles, one, it seems. Um, and yeah, in verse 43, we say, we read, now these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the children of Israel. And then it lists them. And um, these one of these kings seems to be this Shaul of Rehoboth. So we can see that this city uh, is said to be in e Edom, which Edom is Esau. And so again, to me, that has a connection to um, the rejected one, which would also symbolically fit in with being um, Babylon or the broad way, which we are warned against. So now let's see about the other Rehoboth, the one that was a well. So we can read this um, in Genesis uh, 26, which I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but please go read it yourself. Um, I'll just give you the first, uh, the background, and then I'll read the appropriate part. But if you don't know the Bible very well, um, I really suggest you read the whole chapter. Uh, in the first part of Genesis 26, we read the story of Isaac and Abimelech and how Isaac went um, and lived um, in Ger a place called Gerar. Um, and there, the same thing that happened with his father, with Abram and Sarah, happened there regarding Isaac and um, Rebekah, where Isaac lied and said she was his sister and because of this whole thing it ended up that Abimelech actually said that nobody is allowed to come near or touch uh, Isaac and his wife so Abimelech charged his people to say to leave them in peace and so this is where we start where Isaac then started to farm and sow in this land of Gerar. So from verse 12, we read, Then Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now Abimelech is the king of these uh, Philistines, Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abram his father, and they filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So now, when Isaac becomes prosperous, Abimelech doesn't want him there anymore. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abram his father, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abram. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Also, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Isaac, because they quarreled with him. So Isaac means quarreling. Then they dug another well and quarreled over that one also. So they called its name Sitna. So here is Sitna at its very root word, 
And that's very interesting. It means to attack or to accuse or be an adversary or resist. And then it says, and he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. It then goes on to say that he actually dug another well at Be'er Shippa, but my point is that these first two wells yeah have to do with strife and then this one um rehoboth has to do with fruitfulness and having a, a room made for you so today i want to speak about a spiritual place we can arrive at a very good spiritual place and the word rehoboth to me symbolizes that place it is a place where things have broadened a bit for us think of the word broad-minded and then narrow-minded so in order to actually learn the truth we can really not be very narrow-minded um, on the other hand we must be careful that being broad-minded, we end up on the broad way where it's about avoiding strife because you know that this part we've just read, it's about basically these three wells. And at the first two wells, there was strife. Now, if you think of different denominations in our time, you've got different denominations, you can see them spiritually as wells because water is connected to the living water which Jesus Christ gives. So a well, in a sense, could be a church or a certain denomination, spiritually speaking. And out of that well, you can draw the living water. But you can see in this, there was lots of strife at the, these wells. They didn't want Isaac to be there. They wanted the well for themselves out of envy. And you can see also that they closed uh, some of the wells that Abram had, had dug. So there was the strife and contention. And in a sense, I see a lot of that in denominational thinking and also holding to certain doctrines and deciding this doctrine is perfect. A good example is what we had long ago is Calvinism. But there are many different examples. I don't need to go into it where people say that um, only I am right. Um, my way is the only way or our way is the only way. And we are the real true church. So... What happens then is there is no room. There's a lot of strife there because the moment anybody has any new revelation, then they are chased away, just like Abimelech told Isaac to go. You see, so you've got to keep to just that um, statement of faith or whatever the pastor decides or whatever traditionally has been the teaching in in that uh, denomination now if you want the truth you actually need to be prepared to to not just be so narrow-minded and focus just on the teachings of men they have a lot of truth because the truth is based on um, revelations from the Bible, understandings from the Bible, but the problem is they are stuck in that one place. They set up the tent there and that's where they camp and they have their well there and if anybody comes there, then they, um, they fight and they quarrel, just like that well was called quarreling. And then the next well had to do with accusation and and you know being an um, adversary so we need to get to a place spiritually like Rehoboth 
the place where Isaac came to, where he found a place where he felt he could broaden himself. In the same way, I really encourage you not to, to do what so many do and close your mind to different understandings and doctrines and um, to actually go and listen what people say. Because from different people, you can get different viewpoints. We only see partially, um, as in a mirror, darkly. So it's very immature to be fighting. It's like children. And in order to mature and to broaden, we need to get to a well or a place which spiritually I call Rehoboth. Uh, it's just something for me that speaks to me um, and the understanding I have of being open to hearing things. And I'm going to show you now that the Lord actually speaks of that and that it's, it's also got to do with spiritual understanding and being fruitful because we are told uh, a command was to be fruitful and multiply. And in the parable of the sower, Jesus speaks of those that the, the, the seed fell in the good ground and there was a 30, a 60 and a hundred fold increase of that seed. The new covenant, the covenant we are under is a covenant of peace. And yeah, Isaiah prophesies of this state we are in. Now, today we are going to look at it spiritually, being spiritually fruitful and being spiritually enlarged. So I'm just going to read yeah, the first uh, three um, paragraphs and you, you can read the rest of the chapter. It's a very beautiful chapter. It says, Sing, O barren, you have, who have not born. Bring forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. And it's interesting because we are speaking of Isaac, who is the child of promise and the son of Sarah, who actually was a barren woman. But this promise uh, was made to the Israelites that they would be fruitful, that they would be spiritually fruitful and that they would have more children than it says than the married woman so that they would eventually have um, spiritual fruit to show now it says there enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings do not spare lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes for you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. So that this is what I want to invite you, and I'm very excited about this, is to say to you, and for us to hear the Spirit speak to us spiritually, not about expanding physical land or dwellings or physical children but for us to expand spiritually in this new Jerusalem which we have inherited and for each one of us if we believe that the kingdom of God is within us let us expand that kingdom let us hear what the spirit says spiritually to us enlarge the place of your tent stretch out and expand to the right and to the left. So rather than be narrow-minded and believe just what we've learned in our traditions and from, from our fathers before us in their churches and being narrow-minded and just doing this because we are so scared to be deceived, let us stop doing that because what I've learned is the very thing that I feared to be deceived came upon me because of fear of deception. Because what happens is these false prophets know that you fear deception. And so they will, they will warn you against any other teaching 
um, call it heretical and um, insinuate that you are going to hell if you even listen to it. And they also insinuate that if you listen to false teaching, you will fall for it. Now, if you are a baby Christian, that could happen, you see. So that's why it's very, very important that you, when you are a baby Christian, you read your Bible. You must read it and read it and read it for yourself so you know it. And you must be very, very careful to attach yourself to some sort of fellowship. Because when you do that, you get stuck there. And you are not perhaps spiritually strong enough yet to move on. And you can be stuck in a place like that for years and not grow. Or if you do grow, you might... Um, sort of sear your conscience because you don't want to offend anybody you remain quiet and that's not good spiritually but for those of you that are excited to move ahead um that you know feel the excitement that i'm feeling because i really think the lord is doing something he's expanding us that's what i think even though in the world everything looks terrible um, we are being expanded in our understanding. That's my understanding of what's happening. Just like in the first century, um, the, it was the end of that covenant and there was terrible things happening, yet Jesus came and he opened the revelation, that he opened the seals and the Holy Spirit was poured out and massive revelation um, came and Christianity came into being. Um, so there is understanding to be had in individuals and in us as a collective body of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to enlarge, but we must not enlarge in the way of the world by, by going on the broad way, by saying, okay, we must coexist ecumenical movement is the way to go you know we're not going to worry about all the different truths we are just going to get along and love each other that is the wrong Rehoboth the right Rehoboth is the this one where we do it with the Lord and he expands us and he enlarges us by revelation so to do that we need to be very patient and we need to seek the Lord for understanding because he will enlarge our understanding and give us wisdom. Now, I want to show you the danger of being narrow-minded. Paul speaks about it. I'm going to read for you from 2 Corinthians 6 and 2 Corinthians 7, and then I'm going to explain to you um, and also explain what I have seen in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 11. Paul, from his heart, says these words to the Corinthians. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. Now, in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. And then he repeats it again in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 2. Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. I do not say this to condemn. So Paul here is pleading for them to open their hearts. Now remember what I said is to, to make room, Rehoboth, make room, open your hearts. And he says, we are, Paul and the apostles are not corrupting anyone. They are not false teachers, you see, because the Corinthians were very narrow-minded. They, they couldn't receive the things of the spirit he said to them he had to speak to them 
as if they were children, um, babes in Christ who couldn't, who only, who couldn't even receive the milk of the word. They couldn't receive the meat of the word, the mature things, because they were as children. I speak to you as children. Now, this is children in the negative sense of being not mature, not able to receive the things of the spirit because of what? Because of carnality. Okay. And so Paul says there, he speaks of his the open hearts, the open hearts of Paul and the apostles. And he, he says they are restricted by their own affections. In other words, the things they love, the um, traditions and the teachings and the specific um, ways of their ancestors and the things they love of this world, their affections of this world, restricts them. It makes them restricted and narrow-minded so that they are not open to receive the truth and to expand, and therefore they remain immature, a spiritual child. Yeah, in 1 Corinthians 3, we see it. Paul says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, remember what we read about the two wells the, the, and the Philistines being envious and there being strife. And then that thing of division, which is the very thing that denominations are, division. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos. Are you not carnal? So if we are saying, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Calvinist, I'm a Futurist, I'm a Preterist, that is carnal, you see? And then what that leads to is that we do not grow and we do not expand. Even in the couple of months I've actually had this channel, I've um, seen sometimes comments from, from people um, that really remind me of this uh, um, plea of Paul. You know, they accuse you of being heretical or teaching false things, and they don't understand what you are saying. So I find often on this channel, because I... Um, speak of that we are only saved by faith and not by works. That while works will follow somebody who believes and they will do works, works cannot save us. But the moment I say that we are saved by faith, they immediately assume, just assume that I say we don't have to do anything, we don't have to... Um, you know, we can do whatever we like. We can live uh, in sin, which is not what I'm saying. But you see, they are restricted in their affections. They love that doctrine that they have. And they have many different things that have built up that false doctrine that's built on a lie. And so when I speak to them, they don't even hear what I say. They immediately shun me and then they are not open to receive the little bit that I even have to give them. There are wonderful teachers um, on the internet today that can really fill them up even if they're a new believer, can fill them with truth but they cannot receive it because they have a false doctrine or they have some sort of idol and I find it often with people who have made of the physical Israel a idol of their heart. The physical land of Israel and the Israel of today has become to them an idol. And if you say anything, then it just sh uh, shakes their cage and then they come at you and then they accuse you, you know, 
of being a deceiver, which is exactly what Paul was saying there, saying that they've he's they've wronged nobody, they've corrupted nobody. Because especially with Paul, he was accused of the same things because there was Judaizers there. And if Paul was teaching them that the law was that old covenant age was passing away and the new covenant age was coming in and that they were not saved by law keeping then just like today when somebody speaks the truth about that Paul was severely persecuted um he was ex excessively persecuted you you will know if you know, have read the book of acts how those Jews of that day persecuted Paul because of the fact that he was preaching um, the truth and he was being accused even by those in the church that were kept listening to these Judaizers that kept bringing in the Jewish customs. Um, and so Paul was pleading with the Corinthians because the Corinthians, um, they had many gifts. We read about the gifts of the Spirit in uh, the book of um, 1 Corinthians. Uh, and they, they, but they were very carnal also. So he couldn't teach them the mature things. And so that's why I keep saying, um, you know, walk on a journey where you enlarge your mind, your tent, enlarge you, your understanding without clutching to doctrines or to teachings or to understandings. Become comfortable with not knowing because those areas where you don't know, the Holy Spirit will help you and drive you to diligently seek for the truth rather than be a fish that is caught. Now, Jesus sent out the um, disciples and to be fishers of men, but Satan also catches fish. And how he catches it is how I see it. This is just my way of seeing it. It's almost I see like a, a fish being caught with a hook and, and there's a bit of truth that's put on that hook, but the little fish just swallows everything, hook, line, and sinker, as they say. So rather than just nibbling off the, the nice food, that little fish just swallows everything. And that's what happens with us, is if we see somebody that gives us truth when we are still immature, rather than be a good Berean and test the spirits and um, ask uh, um, the Father to give us wisdom, as James said in James 1, ask the Father. The Father does not mind you to ask him for wisdom, and he will not give you a scorpion when you ask for, for a fish. But the devil and his many, many angels of light, they give you a scorpion, you know? They give you a scorpion and they give you a snake when you want a fish and they catch you with their fish hooks, which is truth. And then the hook and the string they're going to pull you out with, that's their doctrine, which they've added in all the um, parts that they don't know with their own false lying ideas. So think about these things, people. Think about how many denominations are there there are 40,000 plus and it's probably it's like the debt in the world that just the little numbers keep rolling you know so rather follow Christ wherever he goes rather be a spiritual virgin don't marry a harlot church or a harlot fellowship and I'm sorry to put it that way but there are so many of them and they they use your your zeal and your love for Jesus just to build a little kingdom you know so I don't want to say don't go to a church or a fellowship because I'm just your fellow disciple as I always say 
this is my experience. Um, you know, they they don't they don't seek. So generally, you'll find people on the internet seeking, but also be careful there. You know, be careful there too. You've got to do this by yourself with the heavenly Father teaching you, because it said they will be taught of God, and you've got to learn from Jesus Christ. He is the great prophet and the great teacher, the teacher that we are to follow. And he will only lead you to good pastures. So yeah, on my blog, um, which is called The Widow's Oil, uh, I have written here, yeah, blessed are they that are empty, for they shall be filled. Now that's not from the Bible. It's just, something I wrote myself there and yeah I wrote these words I gladly share of my oil with those who will take the time to receive and test it the question is are you an empty vessel for if you are full of yourself or of the opinions of the world or of the myriad of religious doctrines of men you may find no place for my words. Far worse than not having space or room to receive my words is not being able to receive the words of Jesus. He warned that generation of the Israelites who were claiming to be Abram's descendants. And he, Jesus confirmed they were Abram's descendants, but he said, my word has no place in you. That word, to have no place in you, is basically, it comes from space and to hold, to admit, and then room to receive comes from the idea of an empty expanse or room that is a space of territory. In other words, place or room. And so it's actually quite ironic that when you want to walk on the narrow way, you need to make room and broaden your mind. And um, if you want to walk on the broad way, you've got to actually be very narrow-minded and you've got to basically reject everything that your group does not agree with. 